Today's video is sponsored by Raycon. Welcome to r slash pro revenge, where a thief tries to rob OP and the thief accidentally leaves behind his unlocked phone. Whoops. Our next Reddit post is from As an Atheist Films. The Job. I was starting my side business doing IT work for businesses, and I had some successful jobs for a few companies. I found that word of mouth was the best way to gain new clients because entrepreneurs tend to network with other business owners. Tony was one such client who had heard that I'd done work for another client and called to see if I could help. He wanted his company to stop using an accounting service because he'd been paying a percentage of their profits to process payments, purchase orders, and billings and receivables. He hired an accountant to work on a new product. I explained that for the product they had, we could probably set up a workstation and not a server, and it would run approximately $3,500 total. And it would be really easy, but no, the owner wanted a full-blown server system with all the bells and whistles. Overall, the entire cost for the system would be $8,000, not including a few other services that needed annual billing, like a VPN or a remote service. Equipment cost was $7,500, and my labor charge was $500. I finished the job on a single weekend, and I got everything up and going. I confirmed that everything was working with the owner, who verbally approved and was happy. The butthole move. I sent my invoice promptly on Monday. As the invoice was written, he had one week to pay. When he gave no reply or payment after four days, I messaged Tony and asked if he had received my invoice. To my surprise, he replied that the server wasn't working and proceeded to call me and tell me that the whole thing was a total waste of money and I should have never taken the job. I, of course, apologized and said that I would be on my way to fix whatever the problem was. When I got there, they refused to let me in to see the server, claiming they had someone coming over to fix my screw-ups. At that point, I informed them that they still needed to pay for the equipment, and we could maybe discuss my labor after I figure out what was going on. Tony refused to let me into the server room, and I was pretty upset. The advice. So, by this time, I was pretty upset. 20 days had passed since I ordered my equipment, and my distributor needed to get paid within 45 days. I was getting really nervous, and I was thinking of taking things to small claims court. Until I talked with a friend, and he told me that I could put in a mechanics lien. I informed him that it was for IT, and he said that mechanics liens where I live can actually be applied to various industries, and IT was one of them. So, I started the process of filling one out and filed a mechanics lien on Tony's company. Much to my surprise, there was no court date. The only thing I had to do to place the lien was to give proof to clerks and then later a constable. Okay, for those of you who don't know, a mechanics lien is basically when a contractor does a job but they don't get paid, they can file a mechanics lien. And what that does is it basically applies the debt to the object itself to ensure that it gets paid. So, like, let me give you an example to make it clear. If you've got a car and you pay a mechanic to fix the engine in that car, and that car is worth, let's say, $10,000, and the mechanic does $1,000 worth of work. Now, normally, you would still have a $10,000 car, and then you would owe $1,000 to the mechanic. But if you don't pay the mechanic, then the mechanic can file a mechanic's lien and basically apply the debt to the car itself. So the owner no longer has a $10,000 car and then a $1,000 debt, the owner now has a $9,000 car because that $10,000 car has the $1,000 debt applied to the car itself. I'm not like a lawyer or like a loan specialist or lien specialist, so I think that's my understanding. Basically, what OP is doing here is instead of this guy saying, hey, you owe me money for the work, he's literally devaluing the company and attaching debt to that company that can't be removed until this guy Tony pays OP the $500. Actually, my mistake, not $500, the $8,000. The revenge. After filling out the mechanics lien and serving him notice, I once again gave him the opportunity to pay me the $8,000 that he owed me. By this time, I'd spoken with my distributor and he extended my payment window from 45 days to 90 days. Tony refused to pay over the phone and I got him on text. So, I took the information I had and went to see the local constables, who, after seeing the mechanics lien and the proof, set up an appointment to meet me at the place of business and take back my servers, UPS, and firewall. I went in on Tuesday, which I later learned was the same day the accountant came in to start their first day of work. The constable and I arrived at 7.30am, right on opening time. 
At first, they refused us entry until Tony came by and he was informed that I was enforcing my mechanics lien and I would be taking back my equipment. He immediately got riled up and claimed that I couldn't take the equipment because a new person had replaced it all. The constable asked if I had serial numbers and models for the equipment, which I did. We go in to find my server, UPS, and firewall all in the exact same way that I left it. The server showed that it had been online for the entire time, with no real changes, and as far as I could tell, no one had worked on it. Tony began to chuckle when I shut the server down and said, How are you going to take the system when it's bolted to the ground? Bet you didn't think about that, did you, you idiot? He didn't realize that even though the rack was attached to the wall, the rack-mounted equipment was not permanently attached to the mount. His jaw dropped the moment that I removed the server and loaded it into my cart after removing just a couple of bolts. Tony started panicking and he told the constable that he would sue the constable if he didn't stop me. The constable simply stayed calm and ignored the owner. I guess after a bit, the constable informed Tony that he had to step back and get out of his face. But when Tony refused to back down, the constable undid his holster safety harness and put his hand on his firearm. Tony's face was exquisite. It was full of fear and eventually a dawning sensation that this was going to happen one way or another. I didn't find out until later why Tony was so riled up and why he was acting like the world was collapsing around him. I wrapped up my server and all of my equipment and I left the rack. True to Tony's words, undoing the bolts proved to be impossible with the tools that I had, so I told Tony that he could just keep the rack. It didn't take more than two hours before I got a call from Tony stating that he had talked to his attorney and he would be suing me for damages and I would be going to jail for trespassing. I informed Tony that he never paid for the equipment, it was repoed, thus there was nothing to sue over. As for the trespassing, I was servicing a mechanics lien with a law enforcement officer, thus it wasn't trespassing. He then starts hemming and hawing about how he needs to bill clients because he hasn't had revenue in a week. But his accountant can't do anything because she has no access to the accounting software and they have no copies. I informed Tony that this was not my problem. I would not be giving him access to the server or the data that it contained, and he should have just paid me for the equipment instead of trying to screw me over for $8,000. He then offered to pay me if I could install the server back the same day, but only if I could do it the same day, otherwise he'd find someone else. I informed him that our original contract was null and void. I would be returning the equipment to my distributor, but first, I would be wiping their storage. That effectively meant a 0% chance of recovering files. Tony started freaking out and resorted back to what he usually did, threatening me with a lawsuit, making my life a living hell, etc. So I hung up on him and I texted him that I was going to delete his data that evening and I was no longer interested in working with him. More advice and the real revenge. Tony called me at least 50 times. But I just silenced my phone and had a talk with my friend later that night, the same friend who had given me that advice. My friend then asked me why would I return the equipment if I had the only copy of all the files, the client names, the contacts, the phone numbers, billing, receivables, etc. He asked me how much revenue that company generated and I said it was exactly $58,678 over the last month. My friend then laughed and told me, why don't you charge them double that price to get the equipment back and have them pay you cash before you start? My friend was right, this was only petty revenge. Also, I was walking away $1,800 short to pay for the firewall that I had to buy in advance and a $500 unpaid labor charge. Why not take it a step further and get pro revenge and get paid a fat stack of money? The following day I messaged Tony, and I apologize for the way that I behaved yesterday. It wasn't professional. Unfortunately, your sucky attitude and attempts to screw me over got the better of me. However, the server hasn't been wiped yet. I would like to consider a new arrangement so we can salvage the sour experience and turn it into sweet honey. Are you interested in working with me to get your equipment back? I must warn you that it'll be extra since I'd be doing double the work. Let me know. Tony immediately called me, and of course he used his typical butthole tactics. I knew you would change your mind and come crawling back. 
Yes, I want everything back, but I'm only paying $8,050 and not a dime more. The $50 is me being generous to give you a second chance to do things right. I told Tony that I still had all the equipment, and in fact, it would only take me 20 minutes to hook everything back up. However, I had a different idea in terms of pricing. The new price was $15,000 cash. Tony immediately started yelling and hollering. I told Tony that he had two weeks to decide if he wanted to get paid by those clients. If not, then the equipment was going back, and that would be that. No hard feelings, and I hang up. About two days later, I get a call from Tony informing me that he agreed to the new arrangement and to please come set everything up and install it ASAP. I told him I could come by Friday, but I would have to be paid $15,000 cash before I even unloaded a single bolt from my vehicle. Tony agreed. I could hear a lady talking in the background telling him that he had to get this resolved because he hadn't had any revenue in two weeks. This phone call was on a Wednesday. On Thursday, I got a call from his daughter, who was apparently his accountant and the lady who was telling him to get everything resolved. She said she was cutting me a check and wanted to know my name. I told her that I would not be accepting checks, and I had specifically told Tony that I was only going to accept cash. She said okay, and she asked me if the amount of $12,000 was correct. I once again correct her and told her the correct amount was $15,000 cash. She said, oh, of course it's $15,000. I'll go make the withdrawal and have the money ready for tomorrow. Sure enough, Friday morning, true to her words, she and Tony were there with $15,000 cash. I, <laughs> I counted out the cash in front of both her and Tony. She made a comment saying that I was a lifesaver because they couldn't go back to the service they used before and they urgently needed to send some invoices out. I placed the $15,000 in my vehicle, locked the glove box, and unloaded the equipment. True to my word, it took me 20 minutes to place the server, firewall, and UPS inside the rack mount. I connected the cables, and I told them to power on the server and asked them to test it out when they got the chance. I said, if anything was wrong, to not contact me and have a good day. I had actually already tested out their server to verify that it was working. Despite my pettiness, I'm still a professional. So on this note, I'm a YouTuber and I've been doing YouTube content for a long, long time and occasionally I'll get sponsors. Some sponsors are really good about paying what they owe me. Others like to drag their heels. <laughs> and it's like, of all the clients to piss off, why would you want to piss off a YouTuber? Because like, you're going to pay me X amount of money to say, hey, try out this product on a video and that's just one video. But if you don't pay me, if you screw me, then I can just be like, hey everyone, such and such basically scammed me and screwed me out of a free promotion, so don't buy their products. And I can say that as many times as I want in as many videos as I want. <laughs> so if a sponsor ever drags their heels and is late on payment, I can always send them a very nice reminder. Hey, don't forget, now that our contract is over, I can say pretty much whatever I want to about your company now. So are you sure you want to be late on those payments? Our next post is from Football RPG. In order to avoid breaking the subreddit rules on doxing, I won't name names. But this is something that's going viral in my hometown, so you can probably find it with a Google or Facebook search. A week or two ago, this guy, let's call him Joe, caught a thief breaking into his car. The thief got so startled that when they took off, they left their belongings there, including their phone, which had no security on it. Well, because everything goes through your phone now, Joe was able to take over the thief's Facebook account and put them on blast. Joe's been posting all the screenshots and messages that he finds incriminating the thief in a series of crimes, including a potential murder that was disguised as an overdose. Joe's posts have linked the thief to storage unit break-ins, car thefts, catalytic converter thefts, home break-ins, shoplifting, drugs, and worse. The thief's phone had videos of her breaking into storage units. It had messages about selling stolen property and drugs. Joe even included screenshots of search histories including how to hotwire a car, easiest car to steal, etc. This is an ongoing saga and Reddit rules prevent me from giving too many details or links to a Facebook account, which is a shame because this is absolutely a pro-revenge worthy story, possibly even nuclear revenge. This has the potential to solve a good chunk of crimes in the area. So, <laughs> 
OP included the actual real like news articles that were written about this story. And going through these articles, it looks like Joe went to her Facebook page and changed her work from like works at wherever to works at stealing. And also Joe changed her name from like Karen McCarrenson to Karen McCarrenson car thief. He also changed her cover image to a stock image of a generic female burglar. It looks like the thief also left behind a bunch of stolen credit cards and even driver's license. And Joe has reunited those people with their stolen cards. So far, Joe has said that he's helped solve five different thefts. Also, if you're wondering why Joe didn't just like give the phone to the cops, well, apparently he tried, but the cops weren't interested. <laughs> so he went all vigilante on the phone and posted all the evidence that he could find on Facebook. Because if the cops weren't going to do anything, he would. Okay, so the story gets even weirder because Joe found in this phone this like really kind of compelling story. Basically what happened is the thief, whose name is Elizabeth, met this guy named Bobby. Then in her phone, she has all this documentation showing that she has power of attorney over Bobby and she's also the sole beneficiary of Bobby's will. Then just a few days later, Bobby died. So it's a little bit suspicious that she would have this guy put her in his will, and then a couple days later, he dies. Suspicious. Very, very suspicious. And apparently, this is so intriguing that a bunch of people online are kind of like investigating this and trying to find out if she actually murdered this dude. This story is so insane. I think, I think it's probably going to end up on Netflix, to be honest with you. I'm looking forward to this documentary because this woman's life is ridiculous. I know that a huge number of my fans listen to my content while they're doing other things like walking the dog, doing the dishes, doing homework, etc. So if you're listening to r slash on the go, then you need good earbuds. That's why I recommend using Raycon earbuds. Raycon earbuds are more affordable than other earbuds on the market, but they still have incredibly high audio quality. They have great bass, they don't slip out, and they have over 30 hours of battery or 8 hours of listening time. So obviously you might be thinking, well, r slash is just recommending them because they sponsor his channel. Well, despite that, Raycon is the earbuds that I personally use. They're the earbuds my wife uses, my brother uses, and other people in my family because I personally recommend them. If you want affordable, high quality earbuds that won't break the bank, then Raycon is a clear choice. Raycon started just half the price of other premium earbuds, but they sound just as good, and they come with a 45-day happiness guarantee. And if you're thinking about getting a pair for yourself, you can go to buyraycon.com slash r slash yt to get 15% off your order. That was r slash pro revenge, and if you like this content, check out my podcast where I publish the exact same episodes. Also, hit that subscribe button because I put out new Reddit videos every single day.